I'm going to take a bit of a skim and dip across this part of um, the TRIA project. And I'm going to keep within the bumpers that Keith set for me, which is when, when Keith invited me, he asked me to really focus on management implications. So I'm going to take a little bit of a dip into some of the things we've done recently that I think maybe have management implications and try to bring, that, bring the message into that quarter. Uh, 15 minutes simply isn't enough to go over all of the things that we've done over the last, uh, the last decade in, in TRIA. So I'm charged with talking about the population genomics of the system. This was actually the theme statement from the proposal, which you see here. I, I, I won't read it to you, but the key elements here are, you know, the goal was to really identify signatures of selection, so adaptive, potentially adaptive um, regions associated with the partners in the system, adaptation to novel habitats, and signatures of selection uh, associated with the degree of host naivete. So that was the idea. And you've seen this graphic before, Janice showed it to you before. Um, this population genomics fits in here. It's somewhere in between the molecular work, which Dezine has talked a fair bit about, the ecological work, which we're going to hear more about, um, and then mapping, ideally mapping into models that, that really do help with, with management. But what is population genomics? And to me, what is population genomics? Well, it's really the large-scale comparison of DNA sequences or markers from populations. So it's, uh, it's like population genetics, but a lot more. It provides, I would say, a high resolution of genetic differences. So this is one of the advances. These are much more dense marker panels than have ever been developed previously. And that gives us some additional insights into some of the features of this system. For example, hybridization or traceability of, of uh, organisms that wasn't possible before. So one of the things we've done is we've developed these markers and applied them to things that I think have management implications. And ideally, I think the long-term goal, or the lofty goal, is to separate the effects of specific genes from the background of what happens at the organismal level by looking across many, many markers across the genome to try to pull out the things, instead of averaging those effects, to look for what are the outliers, what are the things that are different, because they might be interesting. That's, that's sort of the big goal, I think, the lofty one. So in our theme, there were five uh, objectives, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about each of these. So I'll do a bit of a skim across each of these in the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, we had an objective to improve our sampling, because that's important for some of the questions we were, were, were trying to answer. Uh, population genomics of the three partners, of course, pine, MPB, and fungi, and I'll do a little bit of a dabble with each of those. And then try to do something by integrating across all three of those, those, those systems, which is, a, which is a really lofty goal, because you think it's hard to understand one genome. Well, it's hard to put three together and look at all the possible interactions. Uh, that's an exponentially more complex problem. So the first objective uh, in TRIANET was to really to expand our sampling. And this is important because the focus of the last five years has really been on what's happening at the leading edge. This is where we were, we were focusing our efforts. So this is where a lot of the, uh, the sampling has been focused. And okay, it's arguable whether or not Ontario is at the leading edge, but if you, I guess if you project forward, maybe it is. But the goal here was to really sample in areas where the, the, the beetle is currently expanding, cover areas like the north, which we haven't really done very much about, trying to understand mapping the hybrid zone in pine, for example. So the pink dots here really show where we've expanded sampling over the last five years. What have we learned about the interacting partners? So just yesterday, a master's student in my lab uh, named Ian Burns just defended his master's degree, and this is actually, I asked him in his defense, I said, well, what if I was going to give one slide on your, present, on your work tomorrow, what would it be, and what should it say? So fortunately, I guessed right, and this is more or less the, the punchline from Ian's thesis. So Ian typed pine from all across this extended sampling range. He used a, well, it's a low density set of markers, but they're highly specialized. Every single marker is supposed to discriminate lodgepole from pine, so when you put them all together, you get a, a fairly high resolution toolkit for discriminating between the two species and identifying hybrids between the two species and then putting that back on the map. So every single dot here is a population that Ian typed. The light green area is the predicted range of what would be um, pure jack pine, and the dark green is the predicted range of what should be um, lodgepole. And the interesting bits are the hybrid zone. In fact, there's two hybrid zones. There's a northern zone, which we've, we suspected for a long time, uh, in northern BC and uh, Alberta, extending into the Northwest Territories, and a southern zone here in central Alberta, which we're, we're quite familiar with, and we know that that's, that's where really one of the leading edges of expansion is. 
Uh, Ian characterized this northern zone, so we know a lot more about it today than we did yesterday. It's a mosaic. It doesn't simply have um, you know, a handful of F1 hybrids. It actually has a lot of back cross. There's, there's old hybridization in there, multiple generations of hybrids, variable degrees of introgression, and a fairly patchy spatial distribution of where the hybrids are. So it's, it's complex. The southern zone is also complex. The northern, the northern zone has a bit less jack pine in it, probably because it's evolved more recently. The contact in the northern zone between these two species is more recent than it is in the southern zone, so it's a newer hybrid zone, but it's fairly distinct. It has some different features, and it's probably larger than we previously thought. One of the management implications for this is that it's potentially another bridge uh, for the, the pound beetle to reach northern regions. Uh, you know, in future scenarios of climate suitability changes in the north, potentially have another one of these areas where this hybrid zone presents an area which might allow it might be to, uh, to colonize uh, a new host range in the northern part of the range. However, it, it does have less jack pine in it than the central hybrid zone is, so it may be a less favorable off-ramp, if you like, than the one in the southern region is. I'll talk a little bit about beetles, and I'm going to talk about work that's primarily been done with uh, Felix Sperling's group, and in fact there's a poster over at the side here, uh, over at this, this side, by Vic Shigelsky and Aaron Campbell that touches on the topic I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about now because this is, this is quite interesting and also quite recent. So what we've known since the last TRIA project is that there's really two genetic clusters, if you like, of mountain pine beetles uh, in the Upright region in, in Canada. There's a northern cluster and a southern cluster. Each of these graphs here represents a population that's been sampled and each individual has been split into a bar which represents how much of its genotype is of a northern type versus the southern type. So the southern type are the black bars and the northern type are the, uh, the white bars. <clears throat> and what you can see, well, one thing that's come out of this work is it, these animals have been typed using uh, medium density SNPR-A, which means they've been typed at a bunch of uh, genetic markers which are probably near genes which we're interested in. And there's some interesting differences in the outbreak regions. The outbreak, re outbreak regions, you have some signatures of different frequencies of genes associated with things like cold tolerance, a developmental, development, developmental timing, and dispersal flight. So potentially those are candidates for being adapted and maybe that has something to do with their ability to expand. But there's differences between the north and the south and what's interesting is that the Jasper region sort of shows an admixture or a mixture of those two types. That's if you like the suture between the northern and the southern uh, population structure clusters that looks to be somewhat mixed. And there's a hint of this in some previous work, and this has become more interesting uh, now that uh, it's been followed up on. And one of the things that uh, Stephen Travoy has done in Felix's lab was to look more closely at beetles from that area and actually see whether or not you could recreate that, if you like, that mixed type in a laboratory by crossing northern beetles and southern beetles. So this is what, what he did. And this, this uh, graph here illustrates these genetic clusters. You have one cluster here, which I believe from here is that's the southern cluster, and the northern cluster, so the red and the blue, they fall out quite nicely. And then what we have in the middle here are experimental crosses between populations from the northern end and the southern end. They've been analyzed, they come out right in the middle. And right on top of that is the genetic signature of what beetles look like that come from Jasper. They look exactly like what you'd expect is if you had an admixture of northern and southern beetles. So Jasper probably has, has been colonized from both the north and the south. And what's happened since then is that the Hinton beetles have now been typed, and Hinton shows the exact same signature as these Jasper beetles. So they can be traced back to Jasper because they show this signature. It's a very strong indication that Hinton beetles came from Jasper, and they probably didn't come from somewhere in the north. So we have this, um, this genetic signature, which, we, which was a, we were able to recreate doing laboratory crosses. And I mean we, like I had nothing to do with this. Okay, I mean we in the really the broadest sense. This is Felix's lab work. But we do have a toolkit that allows us to trace back beetles to their source population. Sometimes, in this case, where you have you know, a source population that's clearly admixed, it has a specific signature that we can pull out. So future outbreaks breaks from there could potentially be traced further using this kind of toolkit. 
I think it raises an interesting question, which is what happens when you cross the northern type and the southern type. If the northern type is more adapted to colder climates, the southern type is more adapted to uh, warmer climates, and you put them together, what happens in this area where you have this admixture? And it's, it's not a big stretch in the imagination to think that you have a fairly diverse population which may be able to, may be able to cope with a broader range of conditions than either of the, the original types. So that, that, that's a possibility. I'll talk a little bit about the fungi. This is work that comes from uh, Richard Hamlin's lab. So like the beetles, fungi show a north-south population structure. The uh, fungi have a more simple genome, so Richard was actually able to sequence the entire genome of some of these organisms. Um, and what these three figures here show, these are both, these are all phylogenetic trees of the three uh, species of fungi. They all show a similar kind of phylogenetic structure. There's three different clades, if you like. The basal clade is found really south of the border. Uh, and then these two clades here, the green one and the blue one, are found north of the border. So these are southern fungi and northern fungi types. You can't, you probably can't read the names of the, the names on the tips, but it's not really important. We see that, but we do see a similar pattern in all three species. So all three species so, show some genetic structure, kind of along the lines of what we see with the beetles, which maybe isn't surprising because they're hitchhiking on the beetles. What Richard has done, he's, he's done some uh, phenotyping of those different, both those species and the, str the genetic strains, the types that are found within species. And you can see some differences in the response to temperature. So this graph here shows that uh, Ophiostoma, which is the blue line, um, doesn't perform as well as the other two strains at lower temperature, but has a more consistent performance across temperature. So at higher temperatures, it actually outperforms some of these other species. So there's evidence for niche adaptation in the fungi. So different species and different types of fungi are, have different adaptive profiles. If you're a beetle and you carry around a bunch of these different species of fungi with a bunch of different genotypes, it's like uh, hedging your bets, it seems to me. You're carrying around something like a Swiss Army knife, which is going to have the right fungi for whatever environment you get into. Right, that just repeats what I just said. Okay. So finally, to bring it home, um, we're trying to do some work integrating these three things together, which is obviously complex, because each of the elements is complex in and of its own. Um, we know there are differences between pine beetle and fungi, and we know these may relate to a potential. Can we pull that together and look for, are there syndromes, if we like, are there genetic similarities or co-similarities between these groups that are linked to outbreak potential? And this is work that's being led by Patrick James. Uh, and will knowing this allow us to better predict and prepare for future outbreaks? I think this is a, now, this is an open question, but uh, obviously it's something we're interested in knowing. So what Patrick has done is he's looked at, rather than looking at all these genotypes within each species, he's put them all together and they've tried to pull out what co-varies amongst species. So what genetic signatures co-vary between the taxa? And this analysis here has pulled out three different clades of co-varying um, co genotypes. And essentially there's a bunch of fungal genotypes, which you tend to find together. There are beetle and tree genotypes that tend to co-vary and are found in the same places. And there are some um, beetle and fungal genotypes that tend to co-vary. Particularly, they tend to co-vary, you tend to find them together in outbreaking regions. And we don't know really what this means yet, but it's, there's more structure to this than you'd expect at random, suggesting that there's a potential for co-evolutionary dynamics to be an important part of the system. So this, is, this caps it off. These are more or less the implications that, that I've tried to pull out of what we've done over the last five years in less than 15 minutes. And I didn't, I didn't add an, an acknowledgement slide because I knew I'd leave some people out. So I figured I'd just offend everybody evenly by leaving all of you out. But uh, there's lots of people here who uh, deserve credit for the work that I've just shown. Thank you.